Welcome to the New Heights Artist Development City of Santa Clarita Home Recording Workshop. I'm Stephen Levitt from iCreate Sound right here in Santa Clarita. Today, I'm gonna to help you look at your home recording setup and figure out the best way to get a great vocal sound. Let's check it out. So when you're recording a vocal, the first thing you're going to need is a microphone. So when you're recording, there are two main types of microphone that you might choose. There are actually more, but these are the main ones that you'll see. Number one is a dynamic microphone. Most live stage microphones are dynamic microphones. That does not mean they aren't good for recording. In fact, sometimes they can do quite well for certain things, especially loud things. Then there's a condenser microphone. And condenser microphones are the kinds you typically see in big studios, although not always. Condenser microphones are great because they pick up very detailed sounds. The problem with condenser microphones is they pick up very detailed sounds. So if you're in a room that's echoey, see it's kind of echoey and you can hear the air conditioner really loud. Or if you're in a place that has a lot of outside noises like birds chirping, lawn mowers, or cars driving by, and you don't have much sound isolation, you'll find that a condenser microphone will sometimes pick up too much other noise. In that case, a dynamic microphone may be a better choice. Did you know that I actually tend to recommend dynamic microphones for podcasts? It's kind of my little secret. And it's what radio announcers tend to use as well because of excellent background sound rejection. So when you're choosing your microphone, you're going to want to look at those two types of microphones because they have different parameters. If you are using a condenser microphone, you will need something called phantom power. Phantom power sounds really crazy, but all it is is a voltage that gets fed through the microphone cable to the mic capsule to help charge it up. Dynamic microphones don't need this charge. It won't hurt them, but you have to make sure that the plus 48 voltage, which means phantom power, button is on on your mic preamp or audio interface before your condenser microphone will actually work. Some people forget this step and then can't figure out how to get sound on their microphone. A lot of times I will choose a condenser microphone for a vocal that I want to have a very detailed performance. Or like a lot of people have been doing lately, those ASMR videos. ASMR. It's where you want to hear every little tickle and whisper and sound of your voice and uh, you know your mouth clicks and all those things. Um, a lot of times for rock and roll singers, uh, many of them have been known to track with just an SM58, which is like what you see at the club on a stage. And those can work pretty well too. Condenser microphones have a lot more top end, a lot more detail and clarity. And sometimes we can add that back in, in EQ with a dynamic microphone. But if you want that detailed sound, then you might want to choose a condenser microphone. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. So you're also going to need an interface or a mic preamp, but I'm going to show you a Focusrite Scarlett 2i2. Doesn't matter which interface you're using, they all have similar characteristics. So let's go ahead and get some levels. I'm going to have my buddy Rawl do a little singing for me. And he's going to try and find the loudest point in his voice that he could possibly do on the microphone. I'm all set up for my quiet bedroom voice, but now I want to sing loud. As you can see, we're clipping, and that's not good. We don't want to clip because that's going to create some nasty sound. So what I like to do is get that loud singing voice and then turn it down and back it off a little bit just until I get just to the edge. And that way I know I get plenty of recording volume at the bottom end of the range. Uh -huh. But when you're loud, you have tons of room at the top. That's a great way to make sure you don't mess up an otherwise awesome take. So one of the best ways to ensure good vocal sound is proper mic technique. Now there's a couple things I'm gonna show you. Number one is the distance you are from your microphone. This is called mic placement. So if you're six inches away from your microphone, the sound is pretty neutral, but you may also pick up some of your room in the background. But when you get closer to a microphone, this magic thing happens. It's called the proximity effect. Now the proximity effect will help you get that nice warm 
enveloping tone that people really like and, and are familiar with. I always recommend wearing headphones and listening to yourself to see where that optimal space is for your material. Some singers will actually move back in louder portions of the mic, like move off the mic a little bit. So the other thing that you need to get a good professional recording is a good pop filter. And the reason for this is plosives. If you ever take your hand and put it in front of your mouth and get this you can feel the blast of air that happens. People packing popcorn in a popular place. 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 So the other thing you can do is adjust how far the pot filter is from the mic until the plosives kind of go away. So if you're aware of that before you record, that's actually gonna really help you out in not having things later that you're gonna have to go back and fix because trust me, you're not gonna wanna have to do that. So compression is one of my favorite tools in the audio recording toolbox and here's why. With compression, you can take that volume that goes all over the place on your recording and level it out but you can do a lot more than that. You can actually shape the sound of your uh, vocal tone, uh, which is really fun. I tend to use compression the way I use uh, EQ or guitar amps. Uh, so there's a lot that can be done, but today I'm gonna teach you the very, very basics so you can understand what can be a pretty complicated concept very simply. Let's take a look. This is a soft voice for a very nice microphone singing a very nice soft song this is a medium voice singing a medium volume for a very nice microphone this is a loud voice an aggressive voice singing aggressively on a very nice microphone okay so you can see how this section right here uh, is not very loud and then by the time you get to this one here at the end it's pretty loud so we could just try to turn the volume up but at a certain point it's only so much you can go it's a lot more down than up so what we need to do is we need to level it out So I'm gonna play this again, and I'm actually gonna show you on a piece of hardware because it looks really cool and it's a lot easier to see. But basically, if we wanted to turn it down when it gets to this part, and even more down when it gets to this part, we can tell it to curve at a certain volume. This is a soft voice for a very nice microphone singing a very nice soft song this is a medium voice singing a medium volume for a very nice microphone this is a loud voice an aggressive voice singing aggressively on a very nice microphone so I hope you learned the basics of getting good vocal sound on your home recording rig. Remember, there's all kinds of tutorials on YouTube if you get lost or confused. And if you need additional help or you have questions about something else, you can contact iCreateSound and a helpful professional can help you get your best sound. Check out iCreateSound.com. And thank you to the city of Santa Clarita for being so kind to artists. See you later. Hi, my name is Jim Jeffrey. Welcome to my home studio in Santa Clarita, California. Today I'm going to share with you some tips on how to record your own music at home. And so since we're all stuck at home, being safe, we may as well be creative. So let's get to it. So you want to have a piece ready 
to record before you sit down. Now it's, it's possible to use your workstation as a sketch pad, but it's really helpful if you have a chord progression worked out and a vocal melody worked out, or at least mostly worked out. Then have your instruments ready, have your computer, and your um, maybe you're going to use an iPad or an iPhone to record with, and, and your amplifiers. Have everything set up so that when you're ready to start recording, you're good to go and you're not messing around with cables and that sort of thing. You'll need a microphone. There are two types of microphones. There's a dynamic and a condenser microphone. A dynamic microphone has what's called a dynamic moving coil that picks up the sound. It picks the sound up in a more organic way. A condenser microphone requires power to function and it picks up a lot of detail in the room. So depending on your application you may want a dynamic or a condenser microphone. You'll need a computer or a tablet, whatever you're going to record on. Some people record on tape machines, uh, but they're less common. When you're using a computer, you'll need an interface to get your information in and out of the computer. This is where you're going to plug your microphones and instruments into the interface. You're going to plug a USB cable from that interface into your computer. When the audio is coming back out of your computer, it will also come through the USB to the main speaker outputs on the back of your interface and the headphone out so you can monitor what you're recording or what you're mixing. When choosing headphones, don't spend too much money, but get something that's good. I would recommend staying in the $70 to $100 range. If that's out of the budget for the moment, then use whatever you have. In addition to headphones, you'll want studio monitors, which are two speakers that will be on the left or right side of your desk, and they will give you the stereo image that's coming out of your recording machine, so you can do the editing and mixing that's required for your piece. You will also need cables. You'll need XLR cables, which is a microphone cable. You'll need quarter inch cables if you're connecting your guitar to an amplifier. There's two types of quarter inch cables. There's one called a TRS cable, which is a stereo quarter inch cable, which is not for the guitar. That's for connecting your monitors to your interface or your computer. And a TS cable, which is the standard guitar cable. You also need a USB cable to connect your interface to the computer and a pop filter for in front of the microphone. The pop filter is connected to the microphone stand, which can be precarious at times depending on how heavy the microphone is and the position of the stand. So it's generally a good idea to have a sandbag or some heavy sort of thing that's sitting at the base of your microphone stand so it doesn't fall over or move when you're recording your music. Here are some basic definitions that you'll need to understand when learning to record with your new equipment and communicating with other musicians while you're in the recording process. On the front of your interface, you'll often have a selector where you can select between microphone, instrument, or line input. Each one of those different inputs have a different amount of voltage going into the interface. You'll have to adjust your preamp or gain knob accordingly so that you get an appropriate level into your recording software. On the front of the interface you'll have a knob that says gain which is your preamp. This is where you're going to adjust the volume of your microphone or instrument so that you get a good signal into your recording software. I generally shoot for about 50% signal on average because sometimes it'll go louder and you don't want the signal to go too loud and distort inside of your recording software. Condenser microphones, as we discussed earlier, require power to work. So most interfaces will have what's called phantom power, or it'll say 48V, which stands for 48 volts, and that is what powers the condenser microphone so it can pick up the sound. If that button is not pressed in, you will not get signal. And I have to add, when you're not getting a signal into your interface or into your recording software, the problem is almost always something is not plugged in. Even if you think you plugged it in, chances are there's something in the chain that's not plugged in. A power cable to an amplifier, the cable to your instrument isn't all the way plugged in, phantom power button is not on. So before you assume your equipment's broken, just check all the cabling and make sure everything is secure and plugged in. Most interfaces will use a USB cable, which stands for Universal Serial Bus. And that cable is what gets the information from your interface in and out of the computer. You will also use USB cables for other MIDI devices. MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. There's a plethora of different types of MIDI controllers that will control an amazing amount of functions inside of your recording software. 
One common device is a MIDI keyboard, which is a piano that has no sound, but what it does is it activates sound inside of your recording software that you could then record and turn into audio. As I mentioned earlier, there are two types of microphones. There are condenser microphones and there are dynamic microphones. A condenser microphone requires 48 volts or phantom power to pick up sound. They are more sensitive and they pick up a lot of detail in the room. A dynamic microphone has what's called a dynamic moving coil. Dynamic microphones sound a bit more organic, but it really depends on the application. Sometimes you will prefer a dynamic mic on a guitar cab. Sometimes you'll prefer a condenser mic on the same guitar cab. It's really your preference. The same thing goes for vocals. When I'm singing live, I generally sing with a dynamic microphone. In the studio, I will usually use a condenser microphone. The interface is what will transfer your audio, whether it's a guitar signal, keyboard signal, your vocal microphone, into your computer and your recording software, then back out to your headphones and your studio monitors so you can record along with the music and edit when you're ready to start mixing. DAW stands for Digital Audio Workstation. That simply means the recording software that you are recording your music and editing and mixing it in. The front of your interface will have a lot of knobs and inputs, and it's really important to understand what they do so that you can get to business. First, you'll have the microphone or instrument inputs. As we discussed earlier, there's a multi-plug where you can plug an XLR microphone cable or a quarter-inch instrument cable into that same plug. Above your microphone inputs in this diagram, you have the microphone or instrument gain, and you'll need to adjust that so that you get the appropriate amount of level into the recording software. Beside your microphone inputs, there's a small rectangle, which is your microphone or instrument selector. And that's where you'll select whether you have a microphone or an instrument, or sometimes you'll have a line level signal, which will be from an actual keyboard that has sounds that you'll be recording into your software. The red button on the top middle is the 48 volts or phantom power. This is what you'll need to press for your condenser microphone. Now you want to be careful what else you have plugged into the front of your interface because some amplifiers and other equipment cannot handle that 48 volts going into them. For an example, a guitar amplifier may have an XLR out of the back so you can go directly into your interface, but a lot of amplifiers would be damaged by receiving that 48 volts. So really read the manual of your equipment before you plug anything other than a condenser microphone into a mic input which has the 48 volts activated. The large knob on the right is your main speaker output. This will control the volume for your studio monitors to the left or the right of your desk. When you're actively recording with the microphone, you'll want that knob turned all the way down so the sound from the speakers does not go back into your microphone. It'll mess up your audio track and it also could give you really horrible feedback. That's why a good pair of headphones is essential for recording. On the top right of the interface, you have the headphone level. In the bottom, you have the headphone output. The headphone level will control the volume of your headphones only. It will not affect the volume of your studio monitors. Most interfaces will have all of these features, but they may have different labels depending on what that company prefers to call them, and there may be more options or less options on various interfaces. So before you buy your first interface, you should think about the application you're going to want to use it for, because you don't want to buy too much of an interface, and you don't want to buy too little of an interface. The back of the interface is where you'll have your USB right in the center that you will plug into your computer. To the right of that square USB, you'll have the speaker outputs for your left and right speakers, that's for your studio monitors. And on the left side, you'll have other inputs and possibly outputs. These could be quarter inch inputs and outputs, they could be MIDI inputs and outputs, depending on your interface. Signal flow is one of the most important things to understand when you're recording and mixing audio. Signal flow is defined as the path that the audio takes from the instrument through the recording device, or DAW, and then out of the speakers. Again, DAW stands for Digital Audio Workstation, or that's your recording program. And everyone asks which one is the best one. At the end of the day, the best DAW is the one that you know the best because you're going to be comfortable, you're going to know where the knobs are, the buttons inside the software, and you're going to make your best music because you'll be focused on your art and not on pressing buttons on the keyboard. Signal processing is when you affect the tone in various ways to make the sound that you're envisioning for your music. Some of the tools you'll use is a compressor, an equalizer, you have other effects like distortion and pitch shifting, and time-based effects. 
Compression actually takes the louder sounds and makes them quieter so that they're more close in volume to the quieter sounds on your track. And then you can turn the whole track up and so everything becomes louder so you end up having a tighter sound for your track. You want to be careful when you're compressing because it's very common to over compress and it really messes up the sound. So it takes some time to listen and get used to it. Equalizers, they raise or lower certain frequencies and they also cut out certain frequencies. Maybe some instruments you don't need any low end at all. Maybe some instruments you really don't need high end. So you can cut off the lower or high end or maybe you're missing some frequencies in the middle somewhere or some instrument has a real honky sound and you really need to find a frequency and bring it down so that it really sits in the track nicely. You can also use other effects like distortion or pitch shift which will change your sound in a million different ways depending on what your vision is. And last, we have time-based effects. Time-based effects are like delay or echo or chorus or reverb. Delay and echo are very similar. Um, delay has a tiny repeat or maybe several repeats of the sound and an echo is like if you're yelling into a cavern like hello, hello, hello. And then chorus makes your instrument or your vocals sound like there's more than one person singing at the same time. It's actually a nice effect to use when you do have more than one person or more than one guitar. And reverb is usually last, although you can use it really creatively earlier in your signal chain, but it's usually last and it really just makes you sound like you're in a nice big room and it helps everything just to sound perfect. Next we have a basic signal flow chart. The first box on the left is your instrument. The box in the middle is your DAW, and the arrow on the right is the speakers. The next diagram is signal flow with processing. Again, the small box on the left is your instrument, which could be a microphone or your musical instrument. The next box over represents the interface, where you're going to plug your instruments into and adjust your preamps. This next section, which says inside of DAW, signal processing, is where you'll have effects like compressor equalizer, delay, chorus, or other processing like distortion, and then reverb. Reverb generally goes last, although you can mix these things up and experiment however you like. This is a typical example of common effects that you'll be using to process your signal before it goes to the speakers. Once you have your song written, or at least your ideas mostly together, then you want to establish a tempo before you start recording your program. So get a metronome or if you have an app on your phone, I like to use this app that's called Tempo, there's a free version, and you just play your song and, and you get something close to the tempo that you're looking for. I already have this one worked out, so I know it's about tempo. And then spend a little bit of time, possibly, with your metronome. Also use the metronome that's on your computer recording software and that's called a click track. And once you've established that you can play at that tempo and you feel comfortable, then it's time to start getting into your computer. When you're recording vocals, it's a really great idea to have a pop filter. But a pop filter looks like this, and it just goes right in front of the microphone. This stops plosives, which is like a P or a B from um, what they say is exploding the capsule. It doesn't really break the capsule, but it really makes a really bad sound on your recording. So you'll want to have one of these in front of the microphone when you're singing. Now in recording acoustic guitar, you have a lot of options on how you want to mic the instrument or how you can mic the instrument. But if you just have one microphone, if you put it right out in front, you can experiment with the sound by putting it over here or over here. But a lot of times I'll just put it right in front of the sound hole and it generally gets a pretty nice sound. And a little bit of distance is nice so you can let the sound develop. If it's too close, sometimes you get like a lot of the surface noise from the instrument, but not as much of the developed sound of the instruments because sound waves actually need to travel through the air so they can fully be heard. If you're using an amplifier to record your song, then you're going to want to generally mic it up. Some amplifiers can go directly into your machine, but I'm going to show you how to mic an amplifier. 
This microphone is a SM57. It's a standard microphone to put in front of a guitar amplifier. And I have this mic pointed directly at the center of the speaker. The speaker is right here. It's kind of hard to see the, sh the ring of the speaker, but the center is right about there. Now that's going to be the brightest sound. If you want something a little bit warmer, you might want to move it over this way or over this way. You also might want to put two microphones on your speaker cabinet or have a, another type of microphone further away to get some more ambient sounds. But again, it's all experimentation. It's like paint brushes. You just have fun and you just see what happens. So the program I'm going to be using today is called Reason. It's not my main program that I use for recording and editing. I usually use Pro Tools, but this is a really great program that I have on my laptop and it has virtual instruments, which are instruments that you can sequence, which I'll show you a little bit about that. And you can play them on a MIDI keyboard or you can just click them in with your mouse, which is what we're going to do today. And um, there's a lot of other programs that do this. Uh, Reason's pretty affordable, but there's free ones like GarageBand or also um, Logic is a nice one. It's not free, but it's a really nice one. And there are tons of other ones. So you can do your research and, and figure out what works best for you. A lot of interfaces that you'll buy will come with programs for free. So you can maybe try some of those. But this one has a lot of really fun stuff. It has um, a bunch of instruments and you can upgrade it. But what it comes with is really cool. Um, this drum computer. It's really quite fun. It has a lot of different instruments. And this is just the basic drum sound you, you have right there. And what you can do is just like click in these little cells here. Then you could even just copy and paste that, just like Microsoft Word or something. You can play back a simple drum beat. All right, that was that's pretty fun. And um, another thing you can do as you're as you're playing along, say you don't have a drum beat or you don't want a drum beat, but you just want to have like a metronome of some kind happening for you. Down at the bottom here. So this little tiny thing here it looks like a little metronome because that's what it is. You press the word click and it'll give you your tempo. You can also set the tempo at the bottom in the same area. It says 120 there. We'll set this one to 80. And we're gonna you can set the time signature. Today we'll make this one be 6, 8. One, two, three, four, five, six. So like I said, we're not going to be using the drum computer. So we'll just highlight that and get it out of there for right now. We'll go back to the instruments and we will choose this synth. It's called Subtractor. And um, as I said, this program's really fun. You can actually see the gear as if it was analog gear. If you hit the tab function, it takes you to the back, and you can actually rewire things, but you could mess it up, so be careful. And the default is bass guitar, and this is a pretty decent bass guitar for especially what we're going to do today. All right, so we'll get rid of that so we can see this a little bit better. Alright, so sequencing. Sequencing is, is a big word for just typing in the notes that you want to play. And so for this song, it's a really simple song. We have C, G sharp, I mean C sharp, G sharp, and F sharp. Oh, and one other thing, when you're um when you're working in programs, it's it's usually good to actually start a couple measures in because if you even though the program will let you record right from the beginning if you start right at the first measure then maybe the beginning of your guitar strums or whatever will get clipped off and it just kind of doesn't sound that good okay so go back to C sharp 
we're just going to type right in C sharp and we'll play it. Right, I'm going to turn off the metronome right now because I don't really need that because the grid is, is um, perfect. If you see right here on the top where it says snap, that will snap to the grid. And meaning when you click stuff and move things around, it'll move right to the beat. So your timing is pretty much perfect. Sometimes it's a little too perfect, but that's why there are tools to um, help you out with that too. So here's our bass line. All right, and then that happens almost again. Does that again, and then the last note will be different. So I just I just highlighted, I copied and pasted just like in any other document. Um, and the last note just happens to be an E note. That's for the first section of the, of the song. Now this is a short video, so I don't have the luxury of showing you every piece of this software, but so some things I'll just do and I won't be able to explain. Click track. And then we'll go to the next next part. And I'll sequence a little bit of that one as well. And it's a really simple tune. So I just did E, then A, then B. Oh, and as I'm typing here, if you notice on the left side where you can demo the, the notes that looks like a piano keyboard so if you're familiar with the piano it's really you know really nice to see a piano on the left hand side and when you scroll up and down with your mouse it takes you to higher or lower notes in in the um, in the range of the piano but also if you look at the screen you see you have two dark bars and then three dark bars those correspond directly with the two black keys and three black keys of the piano it's just really really convenient so here's our next section. Okay, so E. Oh, let me make sure that I'm in the right place. Okay, and this is so I made a mistake here. Put this in the wrong place. That needs to be an E again. So you just drag it, move it around. Up here on the left where my mouse is, your different tools. So the pencil is the one where you just write in the notes. And you just drag it in for however long you need. I'm just doing like a measure of each, each one. And we'll just leave leave it at that for right now. And this in the top where I have this little R that I'm moving around, that's that's a loop button. Which is, which is really nice because if you want to just hear like a certain section of the song, you can just insert those. So there's a left one and a right one. And at the bottom, there's this, these two arrows that are connected. That pretty universally means loop in any software. Okay, great. All right, so now what we're going to do is create another instrument. We're going to create an audio track. And I'm going to create two audio tracks. The first one will be guitar. And the second one will be vocals. And here on the input, you select what you're going to be singing through. So here, we're going to select Scarlet 2i2, which happens to be the interface that I'm using. And it says input 1 or input 2. I have two options. And, and the, um, the microphone is in input 1. So we're going to use that for our guitar. And we'll also use it for our vocals. So now we're starting at measure three. 
So I'll just bring my cursor all the way back to the beginning. I want to make sure my loop's not going to mess me up. Okay. And we can just turn that loop off. And I'll just get the guitar ready. And I'll record a bit of the guitar. So you have to press the, the little red button. Pretty universal with any software for record. Red for record. And then in this one, I'm just going to press this red button. And it'll start recording. I have my click track on, my tempo set. I should be good to go. We can check that by clicking on clicking on the guitar track itself and we can see there's a green green bar there's tons of stuff you can do this do with this but right now we're just going to listen i'll turn off the click track and then there's a mixer up top most programs have a mixer and they're labeled by the track names that you decide so there's my bass guitar i'll turn that down just a little bit just for right now so we can hear the playing guitar a little bit more. Good, so that worked. That was good enough. Okay, so now we'll record some vocals. So I already made a vocal track. So I'll just click on that track, and where it says in, I'll just check that it's the correct input. Scarlet 2i2 USB, input one. That looks good to me. Then we'll go back to the beginning of the song. We're at measure one, and I'll just press record, and I'll sing the vocals. Oops, made a mistake. So you have to make sure that your click track's on. If you want to use a click track, in this one there, there's a little volume level next to the click track, so I'll turn that down just a little bit since I have guitar and bass already. Was headstrong and blind, you stuck by my side. You did right by me. I was too full of pride, tossed it aside. But you were there for me. But please, please, please remember me. Don't have to do or say. So there's the vocal track. Now a nice thing you can do is double the guitar and double the vocals and that'll give some really cool effects but we'll go over some audio processing in a moment here. So now I've recorded the double on the guitar and the double on the vocals. I'll demonstrate that effect in a little bit. But you can see here's our bass guitar track. Those little lines are the notes that I clicked in. As I demonstrated before and then you can see each of the different tracks here's a guitar track other guitar track um, this one down here the green one is vocals and the darker one is is the what I'm calling the vocal double and it creates a nice effect you, the vocal double if you do it the correct way or a way it doesn't really sound like two vocals it sounds like one vocal with a natural chorus it's a really really great effect so let's just um, have a look around a little bit now since we have our piece recorded. Let's look at the mixer. And every program is going to have a mixer. And this one's right here. It's a really cool looking mixer. Looks like a piece of pro equipment from a big studio. And that functions the same way too. All the tracks are labeled here. You have the mix channel, um, bass guitar, guitar, guitar two, vocals, and the vocal double. And each one of these channels has has a fader, a mute, 
a mute button and a solo, the fader will take the volume up or down and the mute will make it be quiet. The solo will make you only hear that. And then here's a pan, a pan knob, which will take it to the left or the right speaker. So let's play this for a moment and I'll mess around with some of these buttons. So I soloed up the bass. I can turn it up, turn it down to wherever I like it. And I could pan it to one side or the other side. Or if I don't want my bass for a moment, just want to hear the guitar, just mute the bass. Alright, so let's mute that bass for a moment and then we'll listen to the two guitars together. So here's guitar one and guitar two. Here's guitar one. Too. You can hear I'll open up a little bit. It's like, oh, I can hear two guitars, or at least sounds a little bit fuller. Now, when you pan these, then it really starts to widen up. See, when both guitars were right in the middle, it sounds like they're right in front of you. But here, it sounds like a wall of guitars when you put it. Let's look at our sequencer again. We'll create a loop so we don't have to keep stopping our track. Now let's unmute one of the vocals. I was headstrong and blind, you stuck by my side. Right by me. I was too full the guitars. of pride, and it's how I stayed aside. We could mess with the. But you were there the level for me. The vocals. But please, we could pan it. Please, please. But we're gonna keep the vocals right up front. Remember me. You don't have to do or say anything. Now you can hear when I, when I turn on the vocal double. What kind of effect it has? Please, there's a vocal please, double. Please, please, right now. Remember me. So you can kind of hear it. When it's my time, kind of I've spent my last time. There you just can really hear both. Drop a rose, headstrong and blind. You stuck by my side. You did right by me. Then we'll add in our guitars again. I was too full of pride. And so I was inside. You were there for me. But please, please, please. Remember me. Alright, so that's fun. Starting to sound more like a track. Now, this is more like a recording console, so. I have to say maybe it's a little bit more intimidating up here. We'll get rid of the sequencer because we don't need to see that for right now. We'll just look at these green knobs and we'll be dealing with our vocal channel, which is the, the lime green here, and then this row of green knobs, which goes one through eight. Now, when you're looking at a recording console, one thing to really remember is that if it's just like one giant strip, if we just look at the left side here, there's a green row of green knobs, some red knobs, orange knobs, and then then red, green, and blue. And if you look to the right, there's another channel that's exactly the same, the same way. So once you understand one of those strips, you you'll realize that they all function exactly the same, and it starts to become way less intimidating. So in this situation, I'm going to streamline it here. If you hit the red, the blue button, it turns on an effect, and over here in this area to the right, where you have red and um, blue knobs here. Those are your effects. The number one here is a, is a plate reverb, number two is a room, number three is an echo, number four is delay. And so I turned on number one, my green knob, and that, I'll solo up the vocals here, and then we're gonna have some reverb on that. Actually, I'll turn it off, then I'll turn it back on for you. You don't have no to reverb. do or no. say anything, just drop a rose for me. And that's really nice. And then I'm going to turn on number three, which is the echo, but I have it set to be more of like a delay. 
Please, please, please. I'll turn them both off. Remember no, just the delay. Me. Here it is. When it's my time and I've spent my last time just just a little bit. Drop a rose, head strong and blind. You stuck by my Without side. It? Not with it. You did right by me. A little bit of echo. I it was too reverb. full of pride and it's how still side. But you were there for me. Now we'll turn on our vocal double but please 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 and we'll send them to the same effects remember me you don't have to do or say anything so it's really starting to sound nice so we'll unsolo those now we'll solo up the guitars and do a similar thing with the guitars except for we'll send the guitars out to a different reverb since the first one is being used by the vocals we'll use the second one down which says room a room and a plate, there are different types of reverbs, um, you have to study up on that. But we'll send the guitar out to the plate reverbs. I'll play them by themselves for a moment. Then with the reverb. And you can see the light on the right telling it's working. No reverb. Just a nice amount, a little bit. Then we'll add our vocal back in. Drop a rose, head strong and blind, stuck by my side. You did right now we'll by add me. Add the bass in. I was too full of pride, and it's our dear side. But you were there for me. But please, please, please remember. Now, the last thing in this program, you can you can edit some of these things. So I just hit the button next to where it said echo and let's actually just solo up one of the vocals. Me and I'll mess with this you don't have this echo module here. Have to do or say anything just drop a rose for me. You please, can see it sounds kind of like a please, frenzy when you start please. turning it up. Remember me. We just want a little bit. When it's my time and I've spent my last time just drop a rose, head strong and blind. Now let's just turn everything on. Stuck by my side. You did right by me. Now that's pretty close to being mixed. I was too full of pride. And it's our still side. But you were there for me. When you're finished editing and mixing your project and you're ready to export, you will highlight the region. Or in this case, we're going to set a left marker and a right marker for the region that you would like to export. And you come up to File, you will either export the song as an audio file or the loop as an audio file. We will choose Export Loop as Audio File. Then the program asks where you want to save the file, so choose the location for the file choose the type of file that you want to save. We are going to choose WAV file. Next you will hit save and the program will go through the process of saving your song as an audio file. And you can select your sample rate and your bit depth. This is typically what you want to go for. 44.1 sample rate and a bit depth of 16. When you get more advanced, you'll understand why you might want to change some of those settings. Then you hit export and it will export your song. And it's going through the timeline. And done. So this has just been an overview of this program, which is Reason. But once you know an audio program, they all kind of work the same way. So once you know what you're looking for, you can just search around for this and that, look on YouTube or whatever, and find the answers that you need to create your mixes. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video, and I hope this information helped you. If you have any other questions, please visit me at www.jimjeffreymusic.com. And I'll be happy to help you out with recording tips, songwriting lessons, music theory, 
music lessons on guitar, ukulele, other stringed instruments. If you have any other general questions, just drop me a line. Hope to hear from you soon. I was headstrong and blind, you were stuck by my side. You did right by me. I was too full of pride, and it's I was dear side.